This is a resource of Just Loving God. Discipleship, the Radical Joy From Psalm 16, verses 5 to 11 This sermon is entitled Discipleship, the Radical Joy And it's the fourth in this little mini-series about discipleship and its different aspects My anchor text is Psalm 16, verses 5 to 11. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure, for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. And so we've been looking at, as I said, true discipleship, and this is True in the sense that it is defined by Christ, our Savior, not by anyone else, not by culture, not by Satan, not by lukewarm liberal churches. That's not what defines discipleship. Our Savior defines discipleship. And we look firstly at discipleship, the radical call. There's no call like this. We look then at discipleship, the radical cost. Oh, what a cost he paid. And we're called and honored to be able to pay the cost as he did. And then we looked at discipleship, the radical walk. And then today, we're looking at discipleship, the radical joy. Why radical? Do we just mean really hip and cool? That's not what we mean. Radical has its root meaning in the word root. That's where it comes from. The original, the authentic original. The origin of something, that's the radical of it. That's the root of it. That's the source of it. So when we say radical call and radical cost and the radical walk and the radical joy, we mean as Jesus defined it in its original authentic terms. This is as the holy apostles and prophets then defined it after Jesus had ascended. And we looked really at the making of disciples, which is, after all, our calling. We looked at the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 19. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. These are Jesus' very last words before his ascension, and they are extremely important, and we should obey them. But how can we obey them? i.e. make disciples, if we have no idea what a disciple is? Well, what if we don't know what the the call to discipleship is and and the cost of it and the walk of it and the joy of it? What if we don't know what that is? Well, we can't do what he told us to do. How can we obey if we also are not truly disciples? That's a thought. How can we make disciples if we're not really one? Living daily in the call and the cost and the walk and the joy of true discipleship. You see, you can only reproduce after your own kind. You know that. Apes cannot produce humans. I'm sorry to break that to you. (laughs) They can't. Any more than fake disciples can produce real disciples. Doesn't happen. And unfortunately, all across Christendom, there is this false Jesus and this false gospel being preached that has stripped and gutted and filleted the true biblical call of new birth and a walk with Christ until your last breath. It is stripped it of all of that. It's, it's disconnected salvation from discipleship. It's disconnected the call and the lifelong commission and cost. It's disconnected the wonder of new birth from the daily mundane faithful walk of a true disciple, thus robbing millions of the supernatural, impossible joy of being a true disciple of Jesus Christ. That's what it's doing. Instead, 
let us have more unedited gospel preaching, anointed by the Holy Spirit, so that he convinces men and women and children who have been drawn and taught of the Father about their sin, about God's righteousness, and about judgment to come, so that they're actually born of the Spirit and sprung from the talons of hell, and then set joyfully on their course on the king's highway, enduring right up to the very pearly gates of that celestial city. Let's have more of that. So my purpose is very simple today, that you would leave here filled with the joy of being a true disciple of Jesus, and you would have some tools and the determination to live in the joy of being a true disciple. So let's look at what happiness really is. What is joy? What is happiness? What is this? A lot of people make a, an artificial distinction between the words joy and happiness and say, oh, joy is deep and happiness is circumstantial. Well, I don't think that's actually true um, in English. They're just two words. They can be used wrongly. But I want to look at what happiness is. Men look for it. Men desire it. They crave it. Mick Jagger said, I can't get no satisfaction. That's so true of humanity. The US Constitution puts it this way, that all men are endowed with certain unalienable rights. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Interesting. They made a film called The Pursuit of Happiness. And in that film, we are told in very emotional and powerful terms that happiness is the ability to look after your own family and find financial security. That is what we're told happiness is. It's a good film. But it's completely wrong. People think that happiness can be obtained in all sorts of places that it cannot. They think they can get it maybe in rank and greatness. Maybe, maybe I can get it in riches. I'm sure I could get it there. Maybe I could get it in learning and science and the, the rational mind. Or maybe I can just get it in idleness and just live a life of Riley. Maybe I can just get it by seeking pleasure all the days of my life and amusements and distractions. Maybe that's the way. And these are many paths people think that lead them to happiness. But here's the problem. Every single one of those paths ends in emptiness. Doesn't matter what they say. Doesn't matter how happy and laughing and joyful and, and having a great, hilarious time they look. When the lights are off and their head's on that pillow, I tell you, the emptiness comes crashing home. And this concept of pursuing happiness, it basically means two things. If you think you can pursue happiness, it means that you think that happiness is a destination, number one. Secondly, it means that you don't yet possess it. It's a thing to be possessed, and you don't have it, so you're pursuing it. But here's what Jesus says, John 15, 10. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. He didn't say that you may be able to pursue it. He said that it will be in you. You don't have to go anywhere if you're full of God. So joy is not a thing or a destination to be possessed or to be reached. It is the state and the nature of all those true disciples who live in obedience to and love for God. Why? Because God himself indwells them. Joy, in other words, true happiness that has no reliance whatsoever on circumstances is God himself dwelling in the heart. That's what it is. That's what happiness is. And if you notice the first three aspects of the Holy Spirit's character, in other words, the fruit of the Spirit, not the fruits, the actual fruit of the Spirit. These are the first three. Love, joy, and peace, of course. 
So if you have God the Spirit, you have his mind. You have his character. You are a partaker of his divine nature. That's what you are as a true disciple. Many people asked me, someone asked me yesterday, they said, how is it that you're so joyful when you're exhausted and circumstances are against you and your family's sick and people calling themselves Christians hate you and malign you and seek to destroy everything you're doing? And I said, why? Because the joyful one, he who is joy unspeakable, he who is full of glory, lives in me. That's why. And he who simultaneously lives in me and sits in the heavens laughs. He laughs eternally at the fool demons and the fool people who rage and plot and set themselves against his children. He who has the keys of death and Hades laughs at death. And he rejoices over me with gladness. And he quiets me by his love. And he exalts over me with loud singing. Surrounding me with shouts of deliverance. That's the one who lives in me. That's why I'm joyful. Did that answer your question? That is why. All you have to do is look up. So being a true disciple of Christ who pursues him and has left everything, and I mean everything, to follow him and cares nothing for his own life, nothing at all for his own life and lives in personal revival like Enoch and Abraham and Peter and John and would die today for his or her Lord rather than deny him. In other words, just a normal standard Christian, that's what I'm talking about, just a standard one, with no chrome trim, no extras, nothing, just a normal Christian I'm talking about here, just so we're clear. That person knows a joy inexpressible that transcends circumstance, that transcends reason, and never, ever pursues after happiness as some kind of destination, because divine happiness, in other words, the down payment of heaven's Beulah land, a taste of the very glory of God himself, has become inextricably welded and fused and one with their nature. That's why. That's what's happened to them. Behold, all things have become new for that person. <laughs> That person has had the path of life made known to them. That's why they're joyful. And they have discovered that in his presence, oh, in his presence, there is fullness of joy. And at his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit have come and they have made their abode with that person. That's what's happened. This, this Godhead who sticks closer than a brother, who sticks closer than the air you breathe. Oh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they come and fellowship with that person. That's what they do. They comfort and they console and they strengthen that person, that normal Christian disciple. Oh, you must know this joy. You must because if not, you don't know the one who is joy. You just don't know him. You don't know the one who prayed to his father before his ascension in John 17, 13. And he said this, but now I am coming to you. And these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. You've got to spend time on these words. The joy that Jesus had fulfilled in me, that's what he said. That's what he meant. The joy that Jesus had actually coming to fruition in my life, bearing fruit and fullness and completeness 
in me? Yes. That's a normal Christian. Don't seek it anywhere else but in him. Just don't do it, please. I have seen everything that's done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity. And a striving after wind. Even in laughter, the heart may ache, and the end of joy may be grief. Oh, but I tell you, the word of God brings joy. Psalm 19.8 has it this way, beautifully. The precepts of the Lord are right. Rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. And I tell you, to be close enough to God to touch his right hand. That's where you're sitting. And in other words, seated with Christ in heavenly places. Right there, the right hand of the Father. That's a place of daily, unspeakable pleasures forevermore. That, I think, is a pretty good definition of happiness. It's the best I can come up with. And I think Psalm 16 has it so beautifully. For me, it's one of those bits in Scripture that just really sums up what it is to be a disciple full of joy. Let's just look from 5 to 11 quickly. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. That means my boundary. That means the wall around my territory. Oh, this is perfect. It's just beautiful. I have such a beautiful inheritance. If you could just catch a glimpse of your inheritance. Just catch a glimpse of it. How do you do that? Well, just be with Jesus every day. You'll see. Seek him in the word. Read his word. Ingest it. Let it become part of your life. You'll see. You'll get glimpses. You'll see. You haven't got it all yet. It's just a down payment. Oh, but what a down payment. It's enormous. Let the glory you now have inside you in this earthly frame of yours, cheer you along this narrow, hard road. Let it cheer you along. Why? Because you see the end. Enjoy today the first of a quintillion installments of a glory that's so weighty that it can't be described. Give thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He's qualified you for this. You didn't have to sit an exam. He qualified you. He said, you, come on through. Amazing. Verse 7 of Psalm 16. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. Oh, wonderful counselor. Wonderful counselor. That doesn't just mean he's great. That word wonderful in the Hebrew is an amazing word. Look it up. It means he is Mysterious and spectacular and too high and too, too impossibly glorious to describe. Wonderful counselor. Wondrous in mystery. Inscrutable in wisdom. His Holy Spirit within teaches you. Just as he promised, he leads you. He trains you. He instructs you in the night hours. Just stay a while with him. Just stay a while. Don't rush off to your busy life. Stay a while with God. And I tell you, you have there the word wide open in front of you. And as long as you have your heart wide open in front of him, ah, then you will gain wisdom. You will gain revelation from above that takes your breath away, that is life-altering, It will leave you never the same again. This will happen for you because it is his will for your life. Verse 8. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. My decision's made. That's it. I have chosen to set my God always before me. Always. Doesn't matter what I feel, where I am, what my circumstances, how many people lie about me and malign me and question my deepest motives. It doesn't matter. Why? Because I just see him. I've looked. I've made a decision. I will look upon him whom my soul loves. 
I will refuse to set up an idol before me. I refuse. An idol of my own will, seeking my own things. I refuse. I did that once. I will not do it again. I refuse to do it. I will not feed myself instead of my brothers and my sisters. I won't do it. I refuse. I set him before my face. When I'm looking upon him, and I know he's looking upon me, oh, how my conduct changes. How everything changes. And not only is he before me, but it says here that he's at my right hand. Interesting. He's at my right hand, holding me up. That, I think, is a reference to a military lineup. Where the guy at my right is holding his shield in his left hand. And that covers me too. He is my buckler, my shield. He is my protection. Oh, his shield is covering me. How can I, though, be seated with Christ at God's right hand and have him at my right hand? How does that work? Well, I'm in Christ. And so he's at both my hands. And he's at the Father's right hand. So Psalm 91.7 says this. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. Oh, the sides are covered. Hallelujah. And protected both sides. Then Psalm 139.5 helps us a bit more. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Oh, wow. Left, right, behind, forward, on top. I am covered. Oh, but wait. And underneath are the everlasting arms. No wonder I shall not be shaken. No wonder. What can get into this? What can get underneath these wings and above those arms? What? What can man do to me? Oh, let them rage and plot. Let them meet together and plan my downfall. My God surrounds me. Verse 9. Therefore, my heart is glad. (laughs) And my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. Are you a saint? Then you are one of his Holy Ones. This doesn't just speak of Jesus in the tomb. Oh, it speaks of you too. What a glorious thing because we're in him. This enfolding, this encompassing, enveloping, enclosing presence of God is the source of my rejoicing. That's why I can rejoice. All my springs of joy are in you, O Lord. My whole soul and body rejoices at this high and lofty knowledge. It's almost too high for me to understand. Is this really true, Lord? Is this really true? It is true. He cannot lie. So I do not fear any who can kill the body. Just don't fear them. They could kill my body. They've killed many of my brothers and sisters through the centuries. There's people dying today because they love my Lord. But I don't fear them. I fear another. What can man do to me? I shall live forever beholding the face of God. That's a perspective. Where is your sting, O death? Where is it? You're like a little bee that's had its sting removed. You're like a lion that's had its teeth pulled out. And it might put dentures in, but then they fall out too. And all it can do is just gum you. (laughs) What can you do to me, O man? You raging fool. That's what the Bible calls you. You blasphemer against the name of the Lord. I shall be raised incorruptible, just like my Savior, Jesus Christ. What can man do to me? Verse 11. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. By the beautiful feet of evangelists that carried this gospel to me, that day, nearly 40 years ago, 
my God has shown me that narrow wicket gate and that narrow way that leads to life. Oh, how beautiful were those feet. He's shown me the incomprehensible joy of following him as a true disciple every day. That's what he's shown me. And as each year goes by and as I press in to this and claim what he's already said is mine and I appropriate it for myself, oh, well, I I prove him over and over and over again why this is true, why I can live in this because he said I could. My faith grows. He has taught me how to live in his presence. Doesn't mean it's not hard some days. It is hard some days. Oh my goodness me, it's hard some days. But he's taught me how. He's taught me that privileged place at his right hand. He's taught me how to live there in the secret place of the Most High, where my joy is full. Where it's incapable of being tarnished by the tears and the trouble of life. You know earthly treasure, it tarnishes. You cry on that, it just rusts. This treasure, mm mm-mm. It just shines more with the tears (laughs) because he catches all the tears. It's beautiful. And where there are pleasures, I find this place right there at his right hand. These pleasures are exceeding anything that the flesh can offer. And I have tried. I tried what the flesh could offer. And I found a wasteland in my soul. I found a thirst so unquenchable. I didn't matter how much I drank the filth. I just couldn't quench it. Never went away. Oh, but these pleasures. You think that the flesh gives you pleasure? Is that what you think? Oh, then you know nothing of true pleasure. You will see. You will see. And I'll tell you, you will see in this life if you press into God. You can never go back, you know. I've been ruined for anything less. The world has just lost my heart, and heaven has it. That's it. God's word truly is a lamp to my feet. It lights my path. So I don't get lost and stumble in the darkness of my own introspection. Because that's where so many of you sit. Because somehow I've glimpsed the one who speaks. And that is what I'm talking about when I speak of Bible reading and prayer. This is all I'm really talking about. Being with him in his presence. The power of God right there. And you know the glory of being a true disciple is you are not alone. Here's another aspect of the joy of it all. True disciples find joy that no one else can find in the Bible. I'm sorry, it's exclusive. It's completely exclusive. You're out if you're not a disciple. You will never, ever find this joy in Scripture that the true disciples know. So what had you better do? You'd better become a true disciple. You see, these disciples, they read the Bible differently. Their Boaz has instructed the angels to leave gleanings generously in this harvest of manna. So you go and you can gather armfuls of life from his word. His true disciples have their eyes opened to eternal and the breathtaking scale of the communion of the saints. They see as they read, oh, I've stumbled across a sister here who I didn't even know I had. She has the same heart and spirit as me. Oh, I found a brother in the book here. He he lived abroad. I, I hadn't met him yet, but he's no less my brother. I found him. You look, these, these disciples, you know, they read scripture and they, they say, wow, look what he discovered. It's the same as what I've discovered about the Savior. Wow, it's the same. Where else can I go? You alone have the words of life, Lord. He discovered the same thing. That's what I know. I've discovered life and peace. So did he. Oh, I can't wait to talk to you, brother. I can't wait to get there and and chat to you. You you look on and say, whoa, she's just like me. I have the same longing that she had. It's in my heart too. I have a heart after God's. I have the same faith and the same trust in his goodness and his faithfulness. Oh, I'm going to hug her when I get there. 
and we are going to compare notes. I can't wait. You discover you had a sister you didn't even know. You read on and then you say, wow, I struggle like they did. I have the same struggle. But my faith has also proven to be gold, proven to be authentic, going through all my trials. Oh, it's going to be an amazing conversation when I get there. And I talk to these brothers and sisters of mine. I have a family. As I read this, I have a family. And I will laugh and sing and serve with them forever. Oh, this is, this is reserved for the true disciples of Jesus. No one else gets to read the Bible like this. Oh, let that build your joy. You read, and it's just like the Magi in Matthew 2, 10. These wise men, when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And they were led to the two-year-old Jesus bearing their gifts. And so daily I bear my best gifts to my Christ. My golden thanks, my frankincense of dependence, my myrrh of love. Rejoicing exceedingly in the Holy Spirit who always testifies of and leads me back to my Savior. Wow, I found some brothers. Oh, look, it's just like Mary. I joy in the God who saw my desolate, lowly estate and raised me up to sit with him in heavenly places. Luke 1, my soul magnifies the Lord. I'm just like her. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he's looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. Oh, and Isaiah, with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. I get to do that just like he did. Just like the priests of old, they would go down to the pool of Siloam and they would draw water from it and they would march and process back to the altar with trumpets sounding and they would pour it out at the side of the altar at the Feast of Tabernacles. That same pool where the blind man washed and received his sight. Oh, And so daily I draw this joyous, soul-quenching supply from Christ, my well of salvation, who cries to all, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Oh, and then I read on, and I come to David, and I cry out with him when I sin against my Savior. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Verse 10, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. And here's what I find with Paul then. He is faithful, with John, sorry. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Oh, I have brothers in the scriptures. Just as those early Christians rejoiced in the midst of hatred and false accusation, so I rejoice that I'm counted worthy to suffer hatred for the name. Acts 13, 50, the Jewish leaders incited the God-fearing women of high standing and the leading men of the city. They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their region. So they shook the dust off their feet as a warning to them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Oh, let's do some foot shaking. I've got brothers and sisters who shook their feet and went to Iconium. Let's go to Iconium together. Let's find those who will hear. Let's find those who will listen, full of joy in the Holy Spirit. Ah, and as I walk on through the pages of Scripture, and as I walk with God in my eternal calling, and through this temporal cost, I declare with Paul, with all my sincerity, and all of us do the same, we put no obstacle in anyone's way, so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way, by great endurance in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, Imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, by truthful speech, and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, through honor and dishonor, through slander 
and praise. We are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet well-known, as dying and behold, we live, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing everything. Oh, and just look at the Colossians. We get there and look at that church. And you find yourself being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Oh, I'm just like them, Lord. I found more brothers and sisters. Oh, and there's more. I go back and I read about the exile just as those Jewish exiles returned to the land as a type of our final unchallenged possession of the perfect fullness of our inheritance. So the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Oh, there's coming a day when you'll never wrestle with it again. It's just there. It's permanent. It's on your head. Oh, and then I flick open to Jeremiah. Oh, oh, my brother, my brother, young man, just called by God. I can't do this. Yes, you can go, boy. And off he went. Just like him, I have heard the voice of God in my soul. And I cry with him, your words were found. And I ate them. And your words became to me a joy and the delight of my heart. For I am called by your name. O Lord, God of hosts, Adonai of the armies of heaven, Yahweh, King of all kings. They're all just like me, these people. Oh, this is amazing. And we know the end of their, their faith, don't we? So that must mean it's the end of my faith too. Oh, take joy, brothers and sisters, in this. You have the same heart. You have the same spirit as the brothers and sisters of old. Read Scripture and find all of your brothers, your siblings. Go and look for them. Read Scripture and find all of your sisters. I don't have any earthly sisters. Oh, but I have millions of sisters. Wondrous and then just realize they are waiting for you to arrive so they can throw their glorified arms around you. <laughs> Get to know them in Scripture. Study them. Get to know them. You can't pray to them just to clear that up. <laughs> Get to know them in Scripture. You know, you will be friends forever. You and those brothers and sisters of yours. And then add to your joyous anticipation all the great saints Oh, and all the little saints, all the way through the history of the world, who will also be all with you in your eternal state, your beloved friends. They will be with you forever. Oh, I look back through church history and I find my brother, oh, Polycarp. Oh, you're my brother. I have this same heart in me. Maybe I'm not as bold and as courageous as you, but I know in that day, if I have to, the Lord will be there with me. His grace will be sufficient. Oh, my brother, dear old Polycarp. Oh, my brother Bunyan. You could have just signed the paper and walked out of prison, but for 14 years you sat there with your little Mary, blind Mary at home. But you couldn't deny the Lord. You're my brother. And I'm going to hold you in my arms, John. Oh, Spurgeon. Oh, Charles. I don't even have words. I have read everything you ever wrote. And I love you. You're my brother. I'm not praying to him. I'm just saying this is how I feel. <laughs> I'll be with him. Oh, J.C. Ryle. Oh, what a glorious. He was an Anglican, and he still made it to heaven. <laughs> Glory to God. <laughs> Glory to God. He's a miracle worker. <laughs> no, I shouldn't be too harsh. I love my Anglican brothers and sisters. Oh, just get to know your brothers and sisters in the faith. You know this? You're not alone. Let this fulfill and fill up and strengthen your joy in God. Let this knowledge and this hope just increase your joy as you walk through this pilgrim way.
this hard road of discipleship. And one other aspect of happiness and joy is that it can never be uncoupled from repentance. There's nothing like the joy of having peace with God. David spoke of this blessedness, of the man who has his iniquity forgiven. Oh, there's nothing like peace with God. Oh, the storms of your soul because of the sin of your soul. All the waves that just never cease. The exhausting, foaming waves churning up all the shame and sorrow. Oh, may the Lord of glory come and command calm in your ocean as you turn to him in repentance. Happiness is indissolubly joined to a life of repentance. Walk in this as a disciple of Christ. Speaking of J.C. Ryle, he wrote a beautiful little book called Happiness. Read it. He's talking about real happiness, the stuff we've been talking about. He, he recites a story of an atheist, I don't know when, maybe 17th, 18th, 19th century, I don't know when, but he was in the town square, I believe, and he was out there declaring to this gathered crowd, trying to persuade them that there was no God. There is no devil. There's no heaven. There's no hell. There's no resurrection. There's no judgment. Listen to me, everyone. That's what he's saying. And they're all giving him ear. There's no life to come. This atheist standing there and he says, throw away your Bibles. Never, ever listen to a man or woman who tells you to believe in this God. It's, they're fools. Turn away. Suddenly an old woman walked up to him and loudly demanded of him, but are you truly happy, sir? And he looked at her surprised, and he, he spluttered and, and, and was confused, and he tried to change the subject. He said, no, but are you happy? And he said, oh, you know, blah, blah, blah. and he tried to change and move on, and she said, no, you're telling us to throw all this away, but what's at the end of it? Will there be real happiness as a result of doing what you're telling us to do? I need to know. By this time, the crowd's with her. They're listening and saying, yeah, tell us. Is there happiness at the end of this? But his conscience would not let him say that he was happy. He dared not say it because he wasn't poor, wretched, pathetic soul. J.C. Ryle says this. The old woman showed great wisdom in asking the question that she did. The argument she used may seem very simple, but in reality, it is one of the most powerful that can be employed. It is a weapon that has more effect on some minds than the most elaborate reasonings. Whenever a man begins to take up new views of religion and pretends to despise old Bible Christianity, thrust home at his conscience the old woman's question. Ask him whether his new views make him feel comfortable within. Ask him whether he can say with honesty and sincerity that he is happy. The grand test of a man's faith and religion is, does it make him happy? And I mean really happy. You know, if you know nothing of this profound happiness, then you are like that poor, miserable atheist. They laugh and they make jokes and they drink their wine and they mock. But inside, they're devoid of joy. Well, if that's you, then it is repentance from your sin that will explode this joy into your soul. And if you do know this glorious joy of God, then it is an ongoing repentance daily that will produce deep and bubbling and radical, authentically original happiness in your soul as you walk. The joy of Jesus has become your spring. And you can drink from it every second of every day. J.C. Ryle wrote another little book called Repentance. He said this, let no man ever delude you into supposing that you can be happy in this world without repentance. Oh no. You may laugh and dance and go upon vacations and crack good jokes and sing good songs and say, cheer boys, cheer. And there's a good time coming but all this is no proof that you are happy. So long as you do not quarrel with sin, you will never be a truly happy man. Just as an opium eater needs larger and larger doses, so does the man who seeks happiness in anything except in God need greater excitement every year 
that he lives. And after all, is never really happy. You'll never thirst and hunger again if he dwells within. And he is truly dwelling and at home in your heart. You will be filled with all the fullness of God. So to wrap this up, this is the radical joy that is reserved solely and exclusively for the true disciples of Christ. That's what it is. You know, so many Christians, even in ministry, are so jaded. They're so bitter because they spend most of their time looking at themselves. That is the truth. They're just mulling over all the wrongs that have been done to them. Mulling over how hard it is to be a Christian. Mulling over the demands that the Bible seems to make. So difficult. How hard their life is. Because they have no eternal vision at all. By choice. They have no enduring hope. By choice. They have no thankfulness. By choice. They have no daily walk of worshipping the Father. By choice. They have no care or understanding of what Christ suffered for them. They are rebellious, self-loving, and their refusal is willful to make God their vision and their joy. I'm sorry to be direct. Actually, no, I'm not. That's the truth. I was looking through the uh, Instagram feed of uh, a Christian guy who does sermon reviews and he posts sort of provocative questions and, and gets discussion going. Some of it's useful and interesting. And I think a pastor or maybe an ex-pastor had posted this and this guy had, post, uh, had reposted this. This guy said this. He's talking about people, pastors, who will come in to take over a church and become the pastor of that, that little church there. You will spend half your week on sermon prep. People will forget everything by next week. They will remember the joke you told. Your children will be taught heresy. They will be the only kids there. They will be strictly judged. You cannot complain about your finances. Nobody cares about your degrees. You cannot afford a place to live. Your wife will envy your time with church members. You will feel guilty about neglecting your family. You will think you're neglecting your flock. You will fall in love with some people. Your closest friends will die. The others will leave. Count the cost before you answer the call to ministry. If you think I'm overstating my case, I'm not. If you think you're the exception, you're not. All the above is just the bare minimum. If you can, find something else to do. If you can't, you're still not called. But if you are, count the cost, then enjoy. Smiley face emoji. <laughs> oh, I tell you, the fire rose in my belly. That made me so angry. I, I, just got, I don't normally comment on social media. <laughs> This is what I wrote. Appalling approach to the most wonderful calling a human could ever receive. This momentary light affliction is working for us an eternal weight of glory. We are to fix our eyes on Jesus and so endure the race. Not fix our eyes on the race and hopefully find Jesus at the end if we're not too introspective and bitter to see him. I love being a senior pastor, even with all the hardships which are nothing compared to those my Lord suffered. And then my daughter jumped in, yes! <laughs> and I discovered that she'd also posted this blistering comment somewhere else. We're both at it. And this other dude came on and he goes, preach! And this other guy came on, amen, brother. <laughs> we got a bit of a storm going there. What an outrage! What an affront! to the glorious calling of God, all because a man just looks at himself. I'll tell you, you can't help but have this bubbling joy. Here's a man who knew it, George Muller. I tell you, I cannot express the, the importance and the joy of knowing God for yourself every single day as a real disciple, just full of glory and full of joy. I cannot tell you. George Muller said this, according to my judgment, the most important point to be attended to is this. Above all things, see to it that your souls are happy in the Lord. Other things may press upon you. The Lord's work may even have urgent claims upon your attention. 
but I deliberately repeat, it is of supreme and paramount importance that you should seek above all things to have your souls truly happy in God himself. Day by day, seek to make this the most important business of your life. This has been my firm and settled condition for the last five and 30 years. For the first four years after my conversion, I knew not of its vast importance. But now, after much experience, I specially commend this point to the notice of my younger brethren and sisters in Christ. The secret of all true effectual service is joy in God. Having experimental acquaintance and fellowship with God himself. Wow. What a difference between that pastor and the other guy. Here's what J.C. Ryle adds in his little book, Repentance. No man was ever sorry that he served the Lord. (laughs) No man ever said at the end of his days, I've read my Bible too much. I have thought of God too much. I've prayed too much. I've been too concerned about my soul. Oh, no. The people of God would always say, had I my life over again, I would walk far more closely with God than ever I have done. I am sorry that I have not served God better But I am not sorry that I have served him. The way of Christ may have its cross, but it is a way of pleasantness and a path of peace. Amen.